Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. And we're going to look this morning at one single verse. It's verse 21. When you find Genesis 49, 21, if you would please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. By now you should be very familiar with this passage. Jacob is prophetically blessing his 12 sons in this chapter. And as we've worked our way through this series together, we have looked at several of these verses. And we will continue to do so until we finish this series. In verse 1, he makes the following prophecy regarding his son, Naphtali. He says, Naphtali is a doe let loose. He gives beautiful words. Father God, as we come to you this morning, Lord, to talk about Naphtali and the tribe of Israel that bears his name. God, I pray that you would speak to us through the words of this message, through the words of your scripture. God, I pray that we would hear your voice. Lord, and that we would hear collectively as a church, but we would hear individually as well to the particular things that you are asking of each one of us. Lord, and that we would be receptive to whatever it is that you're saying to our hearts. God, and that we would be agreeable and obedient to whatever you request. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Be consistent in your faith and in your practice. Avoid excessive anger and cruelty. Turn from your sinfulness, your wickedness. Repent and be restored. Demonstrate courageous leadership. In your service to God and to others. Place the Lord first and foremost in your life. And do not worship or bow down to idols. These five lessons are the major lessons that we have con considered and covered so far in our series on the 12 tribes of Israel. This morning we are at the midpoint of our study through these tribes. And today we will focus our attention on a lesser known tribe of Israel, that of Naphtali. Naphtali is the sixth son of Jacob and like his brothers, he is the patriarch of a large family that evolved from him and from his family line. The tribe of Naphtali, like the others, plays an important role, a unique role in Scripture, and it is the fifth, formerly, of the twelve tribes of Israel, again excluding Levi. Like the others, they too have left an enduring legacy, that we as Christians can learn from even still today. And their role in biblical history is not yet complete. And before we jump into our sermon on Naphtali today, let me delve into just a, a moment, an event that's described in the Old Testament which involves all 12 of the tribes. I'm going to try to touch on some of these in the remaining sermons of the series, just so you can see some various places throughout Scripture where the 12 tribes are mentioned. And in this event, after crossing the Red Sea during the Exodus, Moses led the children to Mount Sinai, and they camped there on the plains of Sinai for about two years. Why so long? Well, one of the major tasks that they underwent while they were camped at Mount Sinai is that they built... The tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent, a large tent, that served as the temple prior to the temple. 
You see, the tabernacle was portable because it was a tent. And God gave them instructions on how to make it through Moses and all of the furnishings that went inside it, much of which was replicated later in the temple, if not moved from the tabernacle to the temple. And the tabernacle served as God's dwelling place during the years prior to King Solomon, centuries later, actually building a structure that we call the temple in the city of Jerusalem. The tabernacle served as God's dwelling place for years and years. And when they completed it, they erected it, put it together, set it up on the plains of Sinai, there in front of Mount Sinai. And Scripture says in Numbers chapter 27 that they held a dedication ceremony for it. And as a major component of the dedication ceremony, each of the 12 tribes named a representative for their tribe, a prominent leader that represented their tribe. And one by one, one person each day for 12 days, the representative from each tribe came and brought an offering of dedication for the tabernacle. The tribes brought these in the same order that they marched, which we'll look at again today. And so Judah went first and brought theirs one day, and then the next day the second tribe came, and the third tribe. We've learned that Reuben was fourth. We learned that Re uh, Simeon was fifth. We've learned that Levi did not come in the marching order. They were actually there at the temple and tabernacle and are not officially considered one of the 12 tribes. We learned last week that Dan came 10th. The tribe of Naphtali also participated in this ceremony. The sons of Naphtali were the last of the tribes to present their offering. And so today we will jump into scripture and see what the Bible tells us about Naphtali. What does it teach us about the man and about the tribe that he fathered? But more importantly, what lessons can we learn and apply to our life today other than just mere facts that can transform us and shape us in our walk with the Lord? Well, Let's begin by talking about the son of Jacob, Naphtali, the, the sixth son of Jacob. Naphtali was born of Bilhah. If you remember, Bilhah also was the mother of Dan, who we discussed last week. Dan and Bilhah were the two sons, or Dan and Naphtali were the two sons of Bilhah. Naphtali was her second and final son. Bilhah was the handmaiden of Rachel. Rachel was unable to bear children for herself. And so she allowed Bilhah, her handmaiden, to birth children through Jacob on her behalf. And according to the Jewish custom, they became Rachel's children, though she was not the biological mother, the children did not come directly from her womb, but Rachel was the de facto mother, and Bilhah uh, carried the babies for her. So, after Naphtali's birth, Rachel was now considered the mother of two of Jacob's sons, Dan and now Naphtali. However, Rachel's sister... Leah was still the mother of four of Jacob's sons, which we've already discussed. You know, this spat between Rachel and Le Leah, it, j it was just ongoing. Leah was jealous of Rachel. Rachel was jealous of Leah. The two just had this familial sister spat against each other. And, you know... It just, it just never stopped. It will be a recurring theme throughout the birth of all of these children that we will discuss. But in this case, Rachel felt as though that she had been wrestling with her sister Leah for the affections of 
their husband Jacob, and she had finally won. And so she named this new child Naphtali, which means my struggle. My struggle. Interestingly, Naphtali, like some of the other sons, is not talked about much in Scripture during his lifetime. The individual man named Naphtali is not singled out or named specifically very often at all. Again, we've heard this story week after week in this series, and I'll just throw it out there every week. We can assume that Naphtali was one of was with his brothers and was one of the, the men present, the young men present, when they conspired together and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. We can also assume that years later, when Jacob sent his boys to Egypt during the famine to buy grain because there was none in the land of Canaan, and he sent his sons Ten of his sons, and the next time, uh, ten, ten of his sons again. We can assume, even though he's not named, that Naphtali was one of those who made the journey back and forth to Egypt to purchase grain to get them through the famine. Also, we know that Naphtali, along with his family, moved along with all of his brothers and their families when Jacob and his sons resettled in Egypt, in the land of Goshen. And we know that Naphtali, at the time that they resettled to Egypt, had four sons named Jazil, Guni, Jazer, and Shilam. And these are listed in Genesis 46. Other than those few details, we don't know much about the life of Naphtali. But we can learn from Scripture some things about his posterity and the tribe that bears his name. And so let's move on to the tribe of Israel named for Naphtali. I'll share with you some facts. These are not to bore you. Hopefully you're finding these interesting as we kind of look at and compare some commonalities and some differences between the 12 tribes. But first of all, Moses took a census at the early part of the Exodus. Leo, you can go ahead and bounce forward one. He counted all of the fighting warriors, men who were of fighting age, and he numbered them according to those who were 20 and above men. These are the various tribes we've looked at so far. Here's Levi down here that he counted separately. But here's the census of Naphtali that was also taken, by the way, at Mount Sinai when they were camped there for those two years. After they left Mount Sinai, we know the story that they went to Canaan. God told them to invade, but they did not do so. As a result, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They ended up migrating slowly around to the uh, east side of the Jordan River to the plains of Moab. And before his death, Moses took a new census of the new generation because as part of their punishment for, for not going into the promised land, all of the first generation passed away in the wilderness. That's why we don't see the size doubling as they had kids because all of the parents died also. As a matter of fact, the tribe of Naphtali, by the time of the second census, which was 40 years after the first, had decreased in size to 45,400. We've also seen throughout this series that they camped in a particular order. Like his full brother Dan, these two were the sons of Bilhah, like his full brother Dan, Naphtali was also stationed on the north side of the tabernacle. Naphtali was not the leader of his group. That northern quadrant was called the Station of Dan. 
just like this one was called the camp of Reuben, and this one's called the camp of Judah. But he was a part of the camp of Dan with his brother. Naphtali and his family marched 12th in the procession. In other words, they were last. As a result of their placement in the procession, you could say they were the rear guard. Whenever the procession marched, the Naphtalites guarded the rear. They were the caboose. They don't even put cabooses on trains anymore. But that's what they were. The guys all the way at the back. Scripture also tells us that the high priest wore an, inor an ornate breastplate which he would use when he went to the tabernacle, particularly on the Day of Atonement, and he went into the Holy of Holies, and this breastplate that he wore uh, as part of his uh, dress had 12 stones on it, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And the tribe of Naphtali is believed by many to be the jasper. The jasper. The jasper is kind of a brownish red gemstone. And so the color that is associated with the tribe of Naphtali is brownish red. We also know that each of the 12 tribes after the conquest of Canaan received a land, an inheritance, a region that was allotted to them. And the tribe of Naphtali's region was way up in the northern area. On the eastern side, it bordered the headwaters in the northern portion of the Jordan River. And it bordered what uh, at that time was called the Sea of Chinareth, or we know it today as the Sea of Galilee. Perhaps one of the major cities in the region there, besides Hazor, was Chinareth. But by the time of the New Testament, Chinareth had become known as Capernaum. And Capernaum is the city where Jesus' ministry was headquartered. This region up in that area where the land of Naphtali was, and then including some of the other tribes that were adjacent to Naphtali, eventually became known as Galilee. The tribe of Naphtali during the kingdom years, aligned, as you would suspect, with the northern tribes. Leah, go one slide farther. After the reign of David and his son Solomon, Israel split into two nations, and at that time, Naphtali, who was up here beside the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Chinareth, aligned themselves with Dan, with Reuben, and with other tribes that we've yet to name in the northern kingdom, whereas Judah, Simeon, Levi, and another that we've yet to name split off into the south. There it went. The tribe of Naphtali, like some of the other tribes, did not drive all of the Canaanites out of their territory like they were instructed to do after the conquest. And in Judges chapter 1, it tells us that they actually conscripted some of the remaining Canaanites in their land into forced labor. In other words, they, they took tribute from them. This could have been and likely was a source of ongoing conflict between the Canaanites that still remained in the land and the Naphtalites who lived right there on top of them and among them in the territory that they had been given during the conquest. As a result, when we get to the book of Judges, we see that the Canaanites were heavily oppressing the Naphtalites and one of the sons of Naphtali, one of the 
descendants of Naphtali was a man named Barak. Barak led a coalition army in Judges chapter 4 under the judgeship of Deborah. And Barak defeated the Canaanites in that area. As a result of their victory, the tribe of Naphtali is praised by name for its courage in the song of Deborah, which is written in Judges chapter 5. If you continue looking through the book of Judges and the era that Judges reigned over the various tribes, you will see that the Naphtalites also came and assisted Gideon when he battled against the Midianites in Judges chapter 6. But after about 350 years, the era of the Judges came to an end when the 12 tribes who had been loosely connected, but all kind of separate, almost like a federation of different tribes, when, when they decided to join together to form a single nation called Israel. And they chose a king for themselves, a man named Saul, and he was the first king of Israel, the nation of Israel. After Saul's reign, the tribe of Naphtali was one of several who supported a young man named David in his bid to become the new king of Israel. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, we read where they sent a thousand captains and 37,000 soldiers to join David's army. We also read about a man in Scripture. His name was Hiram. Hiram was a craftsman who was skilled with bronze. And he was able to make beautiful sculptures and beautiful things out of bronze. And his mother was from the tribe of Naphtali. Hiram was one of the artisans who helped King Solomon in the building of the first temple, Solomon's temple. We can read about him in 1 Kings chapter 7. After Saul, David, and Solomon, we know that the kingdom of Israel split into two. The northern, northern tribes joined together, of which Naphtali was a member to form Israel. The southern tribes joined together, to form the southern kingdom called Judah and Naphtali because of its location was a member of the northern tribe of Israel. The land of Naphtali because it was on the extreme northern portion of Israel was somewhat removed from the bulk of his brother's help and influence. Because he was on the extremities to the north, his land was usually the first invaded and the first ravished by enemies. And we can read in 1 Kings chapter 15 that the land of Naphtali was oppressed by the Assyrians when they finally rose to power. During the reign of Tiglath-Pileser III, the Assyrians came into Naphtali in that whole area and captured and carried off numerous exiles. We know that the Naphtalites fell along with all of Israel when Samaria fell to the Assyrians sometime around 720 B.C. What about the lesson of Naphtali? What, if anything, can we learn from this tribe. Well, first of all, as we read in Jacob's prophecy, the symbol for the tribe of Naphtali is a doe. The scripture we said was, Naphtali is like a doe that has been set free. He gives beautiful words. A doe, as in doe, a deer, a female deer. What do we know about does? Well, for the most, most part, does don't have antlers. 
Now, some actually do have very small, underdeveloped bumps, antlers. But they're nothing like the male deer, the majestic stag, who has this great rack of antlers that hunters want to go out and get them one and mount it on the wall. Amen. <laughs> You know, when you're driving down the road and you see that good old boy pick up, pull in front of you, and he's got that little symbol of the deer on the back, it always says what? Antlers. It's a symbol of, I'm going to go out there and hunt, if my wife will let me go, and kill that deer. And I'm going to bring him home, put him on my wall. I'm going to clean him. I'm going to eat that venison. It's going to be so good. I'm going to make some jerk and give it to my pastor. When we think of a deer, we think of a stag. We think of a majestic, antlered, you know, multi-point deer. We don't think of a doe. But can I tell you something? There wouldn't be any stags if there weren't any does. They're not really regarded as the regal leaders of their family. Oh, they're important. They're strong. They're quick. They're vital. But they're just kind of overshadowed. This is a description for the tribe of Naphtali. You see, when you read the listings of the 12 tribes, not always, but most of the time, Naphtali is the last one in the list. Oh, they were courageous. They drove out the Canaanites under Barak and Deborah. They helped Gideon. They were brave. They always were there they, they, they had some ups and downs, sure. There were, there were some things the tribe of Naphtali did that we read in Scripture that eh, could have done better than that. But, you know, for the most part, they were solid. But they never, ever, ever seemed to be noticed. They just served quietly, out of the limelight, in the background. And for the most part, they never garnered much praise or attention relative to many of the other tribes. And if you know the story of Barak, who was, as I've mentioned multiple times throughout this, a descendant of Naphtali, he is a fitting example. Because if you know his story, you know that God used Barak, but Barak initially responded with kind of some cowardice and some fear, and Deborah, who was not of the tribe of Naphtali, but of Ephraim, I believe, came to Derek and enlisted him to be the general of her army, and he said, I'll do it so long as you go with me. And Barak and the coalition army that was formed for him, that he led, successfully drove out the Canaanites, but if you remember in the story, and it's a fascinating story to read in Judges chapter 4, Deborah made the following statement to, to Barak and said, You will not receive the glory, but instead it will go to a woman. How does that fit? What are you saying? I'm saying that the Naphtalites in part under a Naphtalite leader were successful in a great victory, but they didn't get the glory. They never had the spotlight. Like the doe. They were quick, they were strong, they were important, but they never seemed to be the one on the pedestal. 
the region of Naphtali, and the people were wiped out when the Assyrians came in. The people were displaced. And what happened was the Assyrians resettled that area with pagans and with people from other nations that they had conquered. And over the years, this mixed population of people became interbred one with another, and Judaism in the area was diluted and compromised and became increasingly repugnant to the Jews in the South. And the Jews in the South, by the days of Jesus, those who were living in and around Jerusalem and in Judea had disdain for the half-breeds in what was now called Galilee. The remnants of the tribe of Naphtali and some other northern tribes who had, over the centuries in between, compromised their faith through no fault of their own, by the way, because all the people there were from other nations. There were very few. They, they intermarried and had children. And as a result, they were held in contempt by the Orthodox Jews in the South. And by the time of the New Testament, that which was once Naphtali had become a part of a larger Roman province named Galilee. And the Galileans were looked down upon by the Jews in Judea. And yet, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that such would occur. And in Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet said, Naphtali is a land in anguish. Naphtali is a land that God has treated with content, but then he prophesied that someday God would bring glory and honor to this despised land. And sure enough, when the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came, he grew up in Nazareth, which is in Galilee, the region of Naphtali. And not only did he grow up in Nazareth, but then he launched his ministry in Capernaum, which was Chenareth, which was in the region of Naphtali, which had become Galilee. And Jesus spent the overwhelming majority of his ministry, did a great number of miracles, and felt most home and most comfortable in the most unlikely of places, the meager and often overlooked, forgotten, outcast region of Naphtali, Galilee. And just as Isaiah prophesied, God ultimately brought honor to this little backwoods place by the sea. One of the most wonderful lessons that we can draw from the tribe of Naphtali is that God exalts the humble. Naphtali, which later became Galilee, was a place of no reputation. It was often overshadowed and overlooked or even completely forgotten about. Over the years, it became a, a, a place that was despised by the more pious religious crowd. And yet it was in this place that Jesus called home. Naphtali is a great example of the scriptural truth that says the first shall be last and the last, Naphtali, shall be first. The lowly are exalted. The weak are made strong. Those who have been rejected, those who have been overlooked, those who have been forgotten will be honored in the kingdom of God. Jesus himself, Scripture said, humbled himself. 
forsaking the majesty and the glory of heaven and clothed himself in humanity and came to this earth on our behalf and humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross that we might be saved. All of us as Christians, all of us as Christians, are called time and time again throughout numerous verses in Scripture to practice and embody humility in our lives, in our service, in our relationships, in every aspect of what we do. And so as I close this morning, let me again say that the fifth tribe of Israel are the descendants of Naphtali. They were imperfect people. They made mistakes, but we all do that. But God ultimately honored their humility. They were generally considered to be lowly. They were generally considered to be inconsequential. They were usually the last one among all the tribes. And yet Jesus ministered comfortably there and felt right at home in their midst. In the book of James, Jesus' half-brother wrote the following scripture, which is one of my favorites. It says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We have six tribes to go, but there's only five more weeks until Easter. So in an effort to finish this series by Easter, we're going to try to cover two tribes next week. Again, two lesser known tribes, and hopefully we can get them both done in one sermon. And we may do that again the week thereafter as well. But next week we're going to cover Gad and Asher. The seventh and eighth sons of Jacob, the sixth and seventh tribe of Israel. But until then, this week and every week, I encourage you to practice humility. And Owen, if you'll give me your outline, I'll see if you got it right. We as God's children are called to be humble. We are to esteem others more highly than ourselves and to submit our will to God's. I'm going to let Owen write that down before we pray. He'll get on to me if I don't. Father God, as we come to you this morning, I just pray that you would humble our hearts. God, remove any sense of pride or arrogance or conceitedness we have and help us to learn to walk last in the line. Help us learn to let others go before us. Help us learn to put others' interests ahead of ours. God, help us, Lord, to not insist that it's our way or no way at all. God, help us to be humble in our relationships. Not just with one another, but with you. To submit our will to your will. To forsake our ambitions in order to live out your ambitions for us. God, to put you first. God, if there is anyone here today who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, who doesn't know your Son, Jesus Christ, who humbled himself and died on the cross that they might be saved, 
Lord, I pray that they would make that decision today and come and make it known here at this altar. God, I pray that if there are other decisions that need to be made today, that during this invitation time, that those decisions would be made in a way that honors you and that humbles us. For we ask this in Jesus' name.